Hello there, lovely folks of YouTube. Ren here. I'm here in a very awkward position in my garden on this lovely early spring day here in the middle of March to show you one of my favorite ephemeral springtime wildflowers, bloodroot or sanguinaria canadensis. Let me tilt this down here. You can see it has started to bloom. It's very exciting. This is a wildflower that is native to North America. Uh, tends to grow in damp shade or woodland conditions. It is a woodland wildflower. Uh, only grows to about six inches tall, which is why I have to get right down here on the ground in order to really show you this plant effectively. The um, this flowers are the first thing to appear in the springtime. As you can see, there are leaves. Usually each stem has one leaf associated with it. And let me see if I can kind of show this to you in one of these here. You can see on this one right here, the leaf is kind of wrapped around the base of the stem right now. The leaves are very distinctive on this plant. They, they will slowly open up. They have a very palmate shape, meaning they're sort of hand-shaped, um, very lobed, very deeply lobed, very distinctive leaf. Um, once you've seen it once, you can always recognize bloodroot. It doesn't really look like anything else. So um, it is primarily a rhizome, so um, there are roots that are under the ground here, and I don't think I can really see any. I don't want to disturb it too much because I don't want to mess up what's flowering. But it does have um, these slowly spreading, horizontally growing roots that they call rhizomes um, that form a slowly spreading clump over the years. Um, you can see I've got, let me see, what do I have? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I've probably got about a dozen flowers on mine. And mine has been here for about six years now, so it does take a while. I think I started off with one flower, so it does take a while for it to spread. And it's only really covering about a square foot here. Very small plant, but very dainty, but very pretty. So the most common way to grow this plant is from a root division. Basically, you would dig up a little section of these roots and then move them to another area. Um, most people, of course, get their blood root that way. They buy it from a garden shop. They buy the root divisions. There are not many places that carry them, but there are a few. If you find some place that specializes in native plants, then um, you can definitely find blood root most of the time. My personal favorite online is a, uh, there's a greenhouse down in Florida called Mail Order Natives, and that's one of the places, one of the few places I've found that does carry this online. So it is possible to grow this from seed as well. Each one of these little flowers will turn into a little seed capsule. Uh, usually with about five to seven seeds in it. It can grow from those seeds, but it takes a long time, uh, usually about two to three years before you'll even see any flowers off of it. So as you can guess from the name, uh, the rhizome, the roots of this plant, is a very red color and makes a sap that is very bright red. It looks like blood, hence the name blood root. Um, rhizomes tend to be anywhere shading from pink to orange to red, but that, that red sap is distinctive. Um, it was historically used to make dye and can be used to stain wood as well. However, I'm going to warn you, the sap of this plant is highly corrosive. It will eat away at your skin. You should only handle the roots while they're fresh with gloves. Um, that corrosive nature of the sap, um, it has sometimes been used as a folk remedy for skin lesions, warts, skin tags, melanomas, things of that nature. Do not do that. First of all, it is highly disfiguring. It actually eats away at all of the animal tissue. Um, it will just eat away at your cells far greater in number than uh, what you actually want to get rid of and tends to leave these very distinctive, very disfiguring scars behind. Second of all, it is extremely painful, so don't, don't use that. Try not to have it come in contact with your skin. It is dangerous. Use gloves. Don't use it. The FDA has actually prosecuted people who have um, sold blood root compounds for uh, skin lesions, so don't do it. Um, so, but the good news is that we can still use this plant safely. Um, in magical use, um, just the dried roots, like I said, can be used safely. You don't want to eat it, um, but they can be used in a lot of um, poppets and things of that nature. So um, they're pretty widely used in folk magic and hoodoo in particular. Um, it does 
have a lot of protective energy to it. So the dried roots can be placed above doors or windows or just carried on your person in order to repel negativity. Um, there's also um, one of the hoodoo uh, techniques is to take two roots, preferably one that's sort of red in color and then one that's pinkish orange in color. Um, sew them together into a red flannel bag. Um, and then that bag is then put under the mattress in the marital bed in order to improve marital relations. Uh, the red root is called the king root, and the orange or pink root is called the queen root. And you sort of bring them together in that magic in order to uh, improve sexual relations in bed. So that is <laughs> one potential use of this plant. Um, personally, I just love looking at the flowers. I think that these little ephemeral flowers are magical enough. They will only be here for a couple of weeks, and then the leaves will sort of take over. The leaves will be here for about a month or so, and then the whole plant will just disappear, and you won't see it again until next year. Um, so it sort of reminds us to enjoy these lovely things while we have them. So there's the blood root for you. I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you again soon.